Our business from the bench segment tonight, for the second time in barely 100 days, the Trump administration is defending their travel ban in front of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The key issue before the three-judge panel is whether the president's comments before he took office provide sufficient legal grounds to rule his order unconstitutional. With me now, attorney and Democratic strategist Jan Ronis and attorney and Republican strategist Gail Trotter. Jan, Gail, thanks for being here. Great to be with you, Liz. All right, Gail, let me start with you. First of all, one of the, I guess one of the main criticisms against this travel ban has been that it could violate the Establishment Clause. So very plainly, very bluntly, let me ask you, does Trump's travel ban violate the Establishment Clause, and if so, how? No, it does not violate the Establishment Clause, and it's a settled law that non-citizens can be excluded. It's a fundamental act of sovereignty. And Chief Judge Alex Kaczynski wrote a dissent in the earlier case that you referenced where he talked about that it could be an establishment clause violation, the dissent by the Ninth Circuit panel that heard this case earlier, and that they are, are um, violating the fundamental rights of candidates to be able to express themselves in campaigns, not the establishment clause, but the First Amendment, that they would not have the ability to make the kind of statements that they would like to be free to make during a campaign if every comment that a politician made while he or she she was trying to be elected could become the fodder for future litigation against lawful constitutional acts of elected officials. Right, and Jan, let me turn to you. I mean, is this is this potentially this dissent that Gail talks about? Is that potentially a violation of Trump's First Amendment right to free speech? Well, that it could be a threat for him to say <clears throat> things, you know, just in his everyday life on the campaign trail versus the letter of the law in his executive order? Well, Gail said it's real, it's, you know, settled law. The fact of the matter is somebody, one of the Supreme Court justices years ago uttered that the, the Constitution is what the Supreme Court says it is. And so really nothing's settled till the court weighs in on it. And those are the issues before the court. You know, it's certainly unique. Um, and Trump is a rather unique individual that sometimes it's difficult to separate the campaign rhetoric uh, from the rhetoric when he signs the bills and says things like, we all know what this means. So you know, I think it's somewhat frightening to suggest that this, the court would weigh in on uh, statements, extrajudicial statements, statements that were uttered, you know, at another forum and utilize those to try to determine really what his subjective intent was in signing that executive order. But it's, I think it's a, you know, a right. new event for the court to decide. Right. Let, let me clarify. Let me clarify then. So putting aside the argument, we're not having that argument today of whether it's good policy or bad policy, just whether it's constitutional right. for President Trump to issue this order. Jan, let me ask you then, is this constitutional? Well, I, it depends upon we listen to the out of court statements. I mean, I think it's, it's questionable on its face because it really excludes only the, the original order excluded only Muslims. The second order kind of defined it a little closer and it probably has not a true. greater chance That's of being, true. That's being confirmed. That's not correct though. So, um, you know, again, what's correct is what the court will say is correct. You ask for my view and that's my view of it. All right, Gail, go, go ahead because I don't think that's the text of the second, at least the second order. Well, that wasn't the text of the first order. There was never any text that said Muslims would be banned. It was talking about countries. And most of the Muslims of the world do not live in the seven countries that were part of the first executive order or the six countries that are part of the second executive order. And unfortunately, we have a lot of reporting out there that is trying to mischaracterize the executive order. And I think Jan had a really good point that Democrats and people on the left think that settled law is whatever five Supreme Court justices will say it is. And I think that that's a misunderstanding of our Constitution, that when we talk about whether or not something is constitutional, it's not just a power play. It's not just whoever holds the power of the Supreme Court. We're talking about the rule of law and whether it is under the settled and established practice of the laws that we have decided as a democratic people to pass and to have signed by the president and to have the courts uphold those laws. So it is a different view. Right there, there's a different view of what is constitutional. Right. I think I, I think that might encapsulate the difference in the judicial philosophy between Republicans and Democrats. But Jan, let me turn to you. And this, this happened last week. I found this almost to be unbelievable. I, I would like to think it was inadvertent on the part of this lawyer. But an ACLU attorney was arguing this in front of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. And he essentially said, under questioning from the judge, that 
this travel ban would have been constitutional or could have been constitutional if Hillary Clinton had issued it, but because it was President Trump who issued it, it wasn't. I mean, isn't that in and of itself uh, an extremely unconstitutional uh, attitude? Well, I, I think that the distinction here is, is that you have to look at what, you know, President-elect Trump and President Trump and candidate Trump said throughout the entirety of the campaign and during his presidency. I mean, it was all about Muslims, Muslims, Muslims. And so he put it into in the force in a purported, you know, uh, executive order. And it it appears on its face, particularly if you if you uh, factor in this out of, you know, the statements that he made, it appears to be unconstitutional. Wait, 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 which is it? Because that's different than what you said before. I mean, do we take into account what candidates said on the campaign trail or do we read the letter of the law just as it is very textually based off of precedent? Which is it? I, I never said that we should necessarily take into account. I'm saying it's a unique position before the court uh, that they're, they're asked to decide whether that is accurate or inaccurate. I don't really know what the final answer to the question is, but it's hard to separate the two. And so if the court takes those into consideration to, truly, to try to get behind his true intent, it's going to be a problem for President Trump. But you know, again, I don't know. It's a, it's a unique area in the law. I think it's, it's unsettled as to whether that is right. something the court can take consideration And Gail, of. Gail, correct me if I'm wrong here, but if, if this was the precedent, if this is the precedent that we're setting that uh, a candidate or a president's statements when he was a candidate can be factored into whether their executive orders are constitutional or not, wouldn't that have made any action taken by Hillary Clinton if she had won that election on something like criminal justice reform? Wouldn't that have made those actions unconstitutional? constitutional because at one point in her past she said very insulting and degrading things about uh, black youth I think she called them super predators it is an absurd and illogical judicial philosophy we have a hard enough time getting judges and justices to stick to the letter of the law to stick to the constitutional protections that are written in the black and white of the actual Constitution and the amendments in the Bill of Rights. So if you want to bring in every comment and every statement that candidates make on the trail and have research assistants digging into all of those public comments, the town halls that they hold, the commercials that they have, the meetings that they have with reporters, that is going to be an absurd process. And it will only ser right. serve to make sure that we move further and further from the rule of law. Right, I mean, I can think of a hundred of these examples. Candidates say things on the campaign trail that are directly contradictory to the policy they either sign into law or issue via executive action. I mean, the Supreme Court said that the Obamacare penalty was a tax after President Obama said a million times on the campaign trail that it wasn't a tax, that they didn't factor that into their ruling on that. I mean, I think that's why we have the law, just to wrap this segment up, is to create those parameters so regardless of what an individual thinks individually or how he feels or what his values are, you have to stay within that letter of the law. You have to stay within those parameters so that you don't violate anyone else's rights. Gail, Jan, we're out of time. Thanks both for being here. Thank you.